spot right there. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh. Oh, hey. Uh, I didn't see you there. I am the CNC Gremlin. Your instructor has asked me to help you through his lecture because I was a free download and he is a cheap son of a gun. We will be taking turns guiding you through setting up the Tormach 440 and cutting your part. The acronym CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control, and in most cases uses G-code commands to guide the machine tools through time and space. We will not focus too much on the specifics of G-code. However, there are a few things to briefly cover. Let's take a look at your post from your CAM process. Keep in mind that clicking on a post will allow you to read and edit the G-code on a third-party software. This software could be WordPad, Autodesk, or a similar G-code editing software. Be careful not to edit any of the G-code in these programs unless you have the experience to do so. The first two lines are your program name and comment. For the Tormach, the program name can be anything you want. However, when using the Haas, a number from one to six digits must be used. And in this case, you want to make sure that you have a clearly defining comment to avoid confusing it with another program. Next, you will see your tool numbers. These were assigned in the tool library. The tools that you use in the CAM program must match the tools used by the machine in both geometry and assigned number. As you can see, my tool 1 is 3 quarters of an inch or 0.75. The Z-min, located here, is the furthest distance past your zero that this tool will travel through the G-code. In other words, your depth. It then gives you the tool description. In this case, the face mill for tool number 1. The G-code sets up basic information for the machine, such as absolute or incremental coordinate systems, and a bunch of other crap that the post processor sets up for use on a particular machine. The G54 command is important because this is your coordinate system zero point. Why this is important is because you can have multiple coordinate systems in one post. We will be using one in this class, so just make sure that it is set up as the G54 for its default. So down a little further in the program, sets up your first tool, spindle speed, direction, and coordinate system. The F value is how fast your tool will cut, in this case, 15 inches per minute. That is mostly directional coordinates. X, Y, and Z is linear, whereas I and J are the arcs. For those of you working at home, or you just want to practice using the PathPilot interface, go to hub.pathpilot.com or type in PathPilot Hub in your web browser and create an account. Click on Create PathPilot Virtual Controller. At the bottom of the page, you will see a space to upload your post. Click on Browse, find your post that you saved from the first lecture, and upload it here. Click on Enter PathPilot, then click Connect. Agree to the license agreement, and click on 440, which is the mill we will be using in the lab. Click Save and Start, and then click Continue. This will bring up the PathPilot Hub interface. Click on the File tab to view your files. Now in the top center window, you should see your post. If it is not listed, try hitting Refresh because it may take a bit for their servers to catch up. Click Copy to move it to the top left window. There you can double click it and bring up the G code. Now on your main screen, click Reset, then Reference X, Y, and Z. Now this is only for the PathPilot Hub interface. We will be using a different method on the machines themselves. Everything after this step should be the same on both the PathPilot Hub and on the machines. Mr. Cheapskate here will take you to the machine and show you how to set it up. After installing the USB drive into the Tormach 440, click on the File tab in the center window and you should see your file. Select the file and click Copy from USB, which will bring the file to the computer's memory. Double click to load the G-code and it will bring you to the main screen. You can see that clicking on the file brings up your post. 
it inserts the digital stock plus all of the tool paths. Here we can see the G-code in the top left window. Be sure that it is your file name and comment. Next look at your tools and make sure that your tools are all listed and have the proper tool number. Well let's take a look at the controls for the Tormach 440. You have a standard keyboard and mouse for keyboard and rodent type stuff. We have two additional controls for this machine. One of these is known as the Tormach Wheel Spinny Thingy Axis Changey Stepper Flux Capacitor. It is important to know the nomenclature for the equipment. It says it right there on the website. This controller is fairly easy to use. Kind of like a video game. You can switch your machine axes on PathPilot by using this controller. The A axis is for an additional fourth axis which we will not be using. After selecting an axis, you can use the outside hand wheel to rapid that axis. The further you rotate the knob, the faster it will go. The step function will select the distance the selected axis will travel in one step. We use the step functions for fine tuning our zeros. The inner finger wheel rotating thing allows you to move the axis in steps. You'll be able to feel each step while rotating this wheel. Never use a hundred thousandths or point one as a step. It will move the axis too quickly and is really unnecessary. The other control unit we have for the Tormach 440 is our feed control box, made in-house by our very own electronics guru, Steve Roberts. The controller will manually control the X, Y, and Z axis for manually drilling, facing, and milling. The most important buttons on this control module are cycle start and feed hold. When running a program for the first time, you need to pay close attention to your tools as they are running in the machine. Keeping your fingers on these two buttons will allow you to stop and start the program prior to a mistake. There is also a coolant button that turns on and off the coolant and the black button which sends UCSD rockets to space. Three, two, one. Now let's set up our material and our vise. These are parallels. Machine ground spacers to keep your material at a given distance above the machine ground surface of the vise. The top of the vise jaws is not an accurate surface for measurements as they can have some variances. The table is machine accurate as well as the vise body top and bottom. Using parallels on top of the vice body keeps our piece orthogonal to the Z axis. You want to make sure when placing your parallels in that there is no debris at the bottom of the parallels or at the bottom of the vice. Our toolpath is going to remove material to the halfway point of our blank, that is 0.22 inches for the feature plus the material removed in the facing operation which is 0.02. That means that we need at least 240 thousandths sticking out of the vise or the tool will collide with the vise jaws. You always want to make sure you know how deep your tool will cut. In this class we will give you the size of the parallels to avoid any confusion. However, when working on other projects it is important to remember that you keep this in mind to avoid tool collision. It would benefit you to take your material blank and put a mark in the top left corner with a sharpie which will help you to avoid fixturing it with the axis switched. Place your material in the vise with the longest measurement against the jaws. The way you set up your material in Fusion is the way it must be set up on the machine. Be sure that your workpiece is flat on top of the parallels, free of debris, and then lightly tighten the vise jaws. You can push down on the center of your workpiece to flatten it against the parallels. I can use the depth gauge feature of the dial calipers to verify that I have over a quarter inch of clearance with these selected parallels. Measure from the jaws to the top of your material with your depth gauge and verify that you have over a quarter inch of clearance. 
Finish tightening the vise jaws and lightly tap on the top of the material with a dead blow hammer because when you clamp the sides of the material, it will slightly lift off the parallels from buckling. He he with your material tapped down in place, the parallel should not be able to slide side to side. Next, we will zero our coordinate system to match with the fusion program. Remember that we use the top left corner of our stock as our zero. The common technique to find your zeros in the machinist world is to use an edge finder. An edge finder has a spring on the inside of it. This allows it to move about its axis until it comes into alignment where it straightens out again. Going slightly past its axis causes the edge finder to kick off to one side. The edge finder is 200 thousandths in diameter. You can verify this by measuring it with your dial calipers. We want to find the axis of the edge finder and therefore the spindle. So we'll use the radius of the edge finder, which is 0.1. We are now ready to insert the edge finder into the machine. To load any tool into the Tormach 440, firmly grab the tool by the tool holder, press and hold the black button next to the spindle which will release the drawbar. Insert the tool so that it sits firmly against the spindle and release the button. You want to make sure you hold the tool in place until you stop hearing air being released from the tool changer. If the tool drops down, it will offset your zero and will cause problems. Using the PathPilot interface, under RPM, type in 900. You must hit enter or it will not accept the changes. Do not set the RPM faster than 900 or you will damage the edge finder and possibly yourself when it flies off into the stratosphere. Never turn on the spindle without a tool inserted in the tool changer or it can chatter and cause damage. Now click forward in the right window. This will turn your spindle on. Use your hand wheel to bring the z-axis down and the x-axis along your material on the far left side. You want to be close to your XY intersection in case there is any unevenness in the cut of your stock. Once you get close to your stock, switch to using the inside dial, which is your step function, and make sure that your step is at one thousandths to dial it in. You will see the edge finder kick off to one side, so pay close attention to the tool when you get close to your workpiece. Start moving one thousandths at a time to get your zeros as accurately as you can. Once you hit that sweet spot, set your X value to negative 0 0.100 or minus one hundred thousandths. Let's do the same for the Y axis. Move the edge finder behind your material and lower the Z axis. Slowly approach the material with the hand wheel and switch to one thousandths per step when dialing your Y. When the edge finder breaks, set your Y at 100 thousandths. This time it is a positive value. That is because to zero the Y, we need to move in the minus Y direction. Are you fully confused yet? Well, me too. That is why I verify my zero every time I set up the machine. After you set your X and Y zeros, hover over the top left corner of your workpiece. Try to split the axis of the edge finder by I. Now look at the screen and verify that you set up your axis correctly. You will be pretty close to zero on both axes if you did it correctly. Axes? Axes? We can now set up the Z axis using tool zero and this 100,000 spacer. On this machine, your Z zero is measured from the bottom of the spindle to your workpiece. As you can see, tool zero is exactly three inches from where it rests on the spindle to the bottom of the tool, shown here in our offset measuring device. The spacer is exactly a hundred thousandths. Paired with tool zero gives us an overall offset of 3.1 inches. Insert tool zero in the spindle and slowly bring your z-axis over your stock, leaving approximately a hundred thousandths between the bottom of the tool and the workpiece. Never hit the workpiece or spacer with any tool or this will cause the stepper motors to slip and will offset your zeros causing either a crash or the limit switches to trip. 
Also, don't move the Z axis with the spacer underneath the tool. Instead, move the Z axis using your step function and try to slide the spacer between the gap. You should use a thousandths when using the step functions. If the spacer isn't right, slide the spacer back out and repeat. Continue this until you feel friction between the tool and the workpiece. Be sure that you set your tool to tool zero. This will set your G54 offset. You have to change the offset for each individual tool, but this tells the machine where it is from the spindle to the workpiece. Once satisfied with your spacing, set your Z value to 3.1. This is the gap between the bottom of the spindle and your workpiece. Now retract the z-axis and remove the tool. Again, make sure that your spacer is not below the tool when you raise or lower the z-axis because you can always accidentally go in the wrong direction and crash into the spacer. So make sure that the spacer is removed. Okay, let's look at the difference between a few of these tools that you will be using on the machine. First, Let's look at a regular twist drill bit. In the first video, I showed a diagram of the drill bit and an end mill. Let's look at the two photos and compare the two. Stop the video and look at the two images and see if you can notice any difference. Okay, go ahead. I'll wait. Um, <clears throat> uh, you, uh, you didn't stop the video, did you? Well, that'll affect your grade. You should notice that on the drill bit, the outside edge is referred to as the margin. Notice that the cross-section view shows the margin is 90 degrees and follows the arc of the drill bit with no relief. The end mill, however, has a radial rake angle, as well as the clearance angle, which allows material to be removed radially. On the drill bit, all the cutting is done via the cutting lip and the flank is its clearance. Material is removed and forced down the face of the drill bit. End mills are generally designed in order to break a chip free instead of keeping it in a long, nasty string. The face of the end mill also has a cutting surface. This allows you to cut a flat plane at a desired depth. But there is so much more to cover with mill tools, but I won't bore you with the details. As long as you can distinguish between the two is all I ask. The other tool that we'll be using is a chamfer tool. This tool is designed like an end mill, but the flutes are cut at a 45 degree angle. You can get them with different angles, but this is the most common type. Chamfer mills do what the name implies. Make sandwiches. Chamfers. Oh, oh <clears throat> right, right, uh, chamfers. There are so many different types of cutting tools out there that go way beyond the scope of this class. I will just show you a few so you can get an idea of the different tools at your disposal. So again, whenever you use a cutting tool, always measure the diameter of the tool, even if you got it from a label drawer or if it magically spawns in the machine with the label on it. Let's set up our tools in the order of operation. That way, when I run the program, I can easily access the tools and try to avoid grabbing the wrong tools by mistake. It would be beneficial to write down the tool and the tool number on a piece of paper. Do this in order of operation. As you can see, the first tool will be our facing mill, the three quarter inch face mill. So I'm gonna put that in the first slot. Next we have the center drill. So I'm gonna put that in the second slot. Followed by the three eighths drill bit. Then the quarter inch end mill. And then lastly, we have our chamfer bit. The G code comment lists the tools, but in numeric order, not by operation. Always make sure you put the right tool in the mill for the right operation, or you'll most likely crash the machine. For instance, if I have my machine set up for the quarter inch end mill, and I put the 3 8 drill bit in instead, you can see that the distance between the two is drastic. You'll also notice that the tools have a color band around the tool holder. This helps distinguish between the five different mills we have in the lab. So make sure that you use the same tool that goes to that machine. Okay, let's start measuring our tool offsets. First thing you wanna do is place your tool in the granite block. So gently push down on the height gauge so that it is flat on the granite block and zero the gauge.
Be sure that you use the blades of the gauge, not the reference edge. Between the blade and the reference edge is a 20 thousandths inch gap that will offset your height if used. Raise the height gauge and gently lower it to the tool. Once again, using the blade, do not push too hard on the gauge or come down too fast on the tool. You want it to barely scratch the surface of the blade. This will give you an accurate measurement. Now look at the number on the scale and transfer that measurement to the corresponding tool on Path Pilot. So go to your offsets tab. Make sure that the description is the tool that is being referenced. In this case, the three quarter inch face mill. Change the diameter to 0.75 and change the length to your height offset. Now do this for every tool. You can see that tool number two is also highlighted in pink. That is going to be our center drill. If I go back to my main tab, I can see that my T2 is 0.1875. If I scroll over, it says center drill, so that tool is correct. Make sure my description is right. My diameter is set to 0.1875. And now I'm going to transfer that length. Make sure you hit enter to save the changes. You can see that we're skipping tool number three. Go back to my main page. Tool number four is the quarter inch flat end mill. See the diameter is already set. I'm going to set the height to 2.625. Now use the same method to set up the rest of your tools. If I feel like I come down too hard on the height gauge, I always make sure that I try it again, just to make sure that I get an accurate measurement. Now that the heights are set, head to the main page. Insert tool number one, the three quarter inch face mill into the spindle. Turn down your feed, RPM, and max velocity down to around 20%. This will move the machine much slower so that you can catch any issues that may occur. Keep your fingers on the cycle start and feed hold button as you run the program. Okay, let's make some chips fly. Or some uh, fly chips, eh? <laughs> Use the cycle start button on the controller or the cycle start tab on Path Pilot to start your G-code. Regardless of where your machine is geographically located, the machine will go to its home position, known as the G30. This is generally some arbitrary point the machine sets up with the XY somewhere in the middle of the table and with the Z fully retracted. Special care should be taken to make sure nothing collides with the tool during this process. So make sure you're ready to go before you hit cycle start. In your display window, it should say insert your first tool, your T1 3 quarter inch face mill, in the spindle and then press cycle start. Use cycle start and then immediately use feed hold. If you use the stop feature, it will stop the entire program and reset the G code to the beginning. If you don't need to use the stop feature, use feed hold instead. Let's turn off the coolant so you can see the tool without obscuring your view. Using cycle start, lower your tool slowly to your workpiece and pause it with feed hold prior to cutting into the material, roughly a quarter of an inch above your stock. Now look at your Z offset. If you set up correctly, your Z offset should be around a quarter of an inch also, or somewhere close to that. This procedure is to get you close enough to eyeball your Z offset. If you follow this procedure every time you insert a new tool, you will avoid 95% of mistakes and will help to avoid crashing an expensive piece of equipment. With CNC's, it's all about the setup. This includes running your tool changes slowly and verifying your offsets. With most CNC manufacturing, operators will be running the same part over and over and over and over and over again. That being said, once you run your first part and verify your offsets, you will be able to put a new piece of stock in the machine, hit cycle start, and just let the part run. Now that you've verified your Z offset, let's set all of our feeds and speeds back up to 100%. You can do this by moving the slider or simply clicking on the buttons labeled 100%.
The feeds and speeds were set up for the tool and the machine. So you don't want to run the spindle and the feed at different speeds. All right, let's make some chips fly, but for real this time. Let's line up the coolant so it's facing our end mill. Go ahead and turn the coolant back on, hit cycle start, and watch the magic happen. All right, the next tool that we're gonna use is our center drill. We're gonna go through the same technique we did on the three quarter inch end mill. First, remove the end mill and insert your center drill. Make sure you grab your center drill and not your chamfer mill. Slow down your feeds and speeds to 20-ish percent. Hit cycle start and then feed hold. And turn the coolant down a little bit and aim it at the center drill. And turn the coolant off. And we'll feed hold it above the part and verify that our Z offset is roughly around 200 thousandths, quarter inch, somewhere around there. You can visually see it from the uh, bottom of the center drill to the top of your workpiece. Once again, turn all your feeds and speeds back up. Turn your coolant back on. And hit cycle start. I will use the same technique for every tool change. After changing the tools, before hitting cycle start, I lower my feeds and speeds, feed hold the tool prior to making contact, and verify the offset. For sake of time, I will not explain it every single time I change tools in this video. At the end of our program, we have a brand new baby feature. Congratulations, it's a part. Correction, half of a part. Join us for the next machining video where we do the same thing, but on the other side. Whoa, whoa, whoa. you already did that. Yeah, well, this is kind of my thing. Well, it's dumb. Do something different. Listen, this is my video. And by the way, I'm not cheap. I'm simply on a budget. And if you don't like it, you could just...